Okay, so today we're going to continue with our discussion of coherence theory. And basically what this means is dealing with interference of light that is not one pure wavelength. And if you remember anything from sort of Fourier transforms or signal processing class, the idea of a single wavelength or a single frequency is, is a bit of a limiting case. It's an idealization, right? In order to really have a sine wave that is exactly one frequency, it has to, has to go on and on and on forever. So just from the fact that we turn lights on and off means that nothing can have a pure tone. Uh, from, from the discussion of, of uh, lasers and the little video that I showed about the spectrum of a laser, you can even see that a laser, which has a very clearly defined wavelength, when we, when we put it in the cavity and we move the cavity around slightly, we can actually see that it's made up of a few, uh, a few discrete wavelengths and that those wavelengths, each of them have some finite width. And last time we talked about the kind of an idealized case of a sodium doublet, putting a sodium doublet into an interferometer and a, a low pressure sodium lamp has two emission lines that are very narrow, but, but they're very close together and they're hard to distinguish on any normal spectrometer, like a, that uses a prism or a grating. But by putting it into an interferometer and interfering the sum of those waves, we saw how we could back out a spectrum, uh, back out the distance between those two lines. And today we're gonna really generalize that quite a bit. We're gonna say light of some arbitrary spectrum, say, you know, light from a, a high pressure lamp where the spectrum is much wider, or even uh, light from uh, an incandescent bulb that, that just heats up and glows, has a very wide spectrum, or light from an incandescent bulb that goes through a filter. Like for example, even the filter on, on your camera, the red, green, and blue pixels each have little filters on them. Now that has some narrower spectrum, but it's still pretty wide. And nothing is, is magic about laser light in this sense. Uh, there are certain quantum, quantum things that are interesting about laser light that, that uh, we might talk about at the end or in, in Jedi quantum. Uh, but in terms of the classical interference going through a classical interferometer being detected by uh, detectors that aren't sensitive to single photons, um, laser light is just kind of a limiting example of a very narrow spectrum. But you can pass any light through an interferometer and see interference. It doesn't have to be a single wavelength. And uh, I made a video yesterday, which I'll post as soon as, as soon as we get it edited, where I actually show interference of white light through an interferometer. And the interferometer has to be aligned very carefully as we'll see toward the end of today's class to actually see interference between the peaks and troughs of, of uh, the, the white light. So let me, let me motivate this a little bit. So, so this is actually one of my favorite topics, but it is a, it is a little bit heavy, heavy on the math. And so I'm gonna try, try to go back and forth between some, some picture of intuition and, and some math. And let me say that kind of up until last time, we really talked about a single, uh, a single frequency. So our, our E as a function of time was just made up of some E naught times either a cosine, if, if we're talking about real waves, so cosine of omega t, or if we're talking about complex waves where, uh, where they have a, a positive frequency component and, and we add the complex conjugate to get the real, real part. Um, we usually call this E, E naught plus to the I omega t. And last time we talked about light that had two, two different frequencies and in general, that kind of method will get us to, to maybe light. So this is just one, one frequency. And here's a few, a few discrete frequencies. So E plus as a function of time is gonna equal the sum of some complex coefficients times E to the I omega N T. So each of them has their own angular frequency and their own amplitude. And the amplitude can be a complex number because the the phase of this complex number determines what phase that particular sine wave is at, at t equals zero. But today we wanna to generalize this and, and generalize this to kind of a continuous infinity of frequencies. And things get a little bit complicated in the bookkeeping. 
But if you imagine having a sum of individual frequencies, the generalization of this is, so the continuous frequencies, you would write this as E plus of T equals not a sum, but an integral. Integral from minus infinity to infinity over all of the all of the frequencies. And I could either do df if I wanted to write it as real frequencies, or I could do d omega over two pi if I wanted to change variables from df to omega. So this is just an integral over all the all the angular frequencies of kind of a continuous version of these discrete amplitudes, e of omega. And usually we distinguish e of t from e of omega with a little tilde. Um, times e to the i omega t. So, so this is the spectrum, and we make up a a uh, a wave in time by adding together Fourier components, complex exponentials, weighted by some amplitude. And in general, when you do a complex Fourier transform like this, the amplitudes are are complex numbers, not that helps set what, what the phases of each of those sine waves are at, at t equals zero. But at the end of the day, if we want a real signal, um, there, is, there is the constraint. So let me just talk about two things that make this bookkeeping, that, that we have to just keep track of when we do the bookkeeping. The, the first is that in order to make the signal real, right? I need to have, uh, I'm, I'm adding up frequencies that are both positive and negative. Well, what, what, do, what do negative frequencies mean? So for, for complex numbers, well, I mean, for sines and cosines, negative frequencies don't really mean much, right? A cosine of a negative number is just the cosine. Sine of a negative number is just opposite of the sine. But for complex uh, exponentials like this, negative frequencies really do matter. It's just in the complex plane, does, does something rotate in the positive theta direction or does the complex number rotate in the negative theta direction as, as time increases? So negative frequencies really do mean something. But at the end of the day, if you want something that's real, it has to be that uh, the, the positive frequency components plus the negative equivalent. So when, you know, when omega is uh, 500 terahertz and omega is negative 500 terahertz for, for light, that these coefficients have to be complex conjugates of each other so that the, um, so that the, the, uh, the real parts add up to sines and cosines, and, th and there's no imaginary part left over. So if I have some, some a e to the plus i phi and uh, plus a, a star e to the minus i phi, I could rewrite this. If I write a in terms of the real and imaginary parts, I could rewrite this in terms of real sines and real cosines. And so there's one constraint on this spectrum, which is that the the negative frequencies, E of minus omega, these have to be the complex conjugates of the positive frequencies, E of, of omega. Usually we're not, we're not really worried about the phase very much anyway. We don't, we don't have a, a accurate enough timing to, to worry about the, the actual phase of the particular wave when, when T equals zero. But just mathematically, we have to keep track of this in order to get a real um, a real E of T at the end. Maybe I should write this as plus because I want to write, want this as the final actual physical uh, electric field as a function of time. The other slight bookkeeping annoyance, which we'll run into a little bit later, is the fact that the units are, are a little bit different, right? So when you have a discrete sum over, over uh, several different discrete frequencies, um, this, so e, e to the something is dimensionless. And so this coefficient has the units of the same units as the electric field. When you have an integral like this, we're really talking about a frequency density here. So the units of E tilde omega, oops, E tilde omega, these aren't quite the units of E. These are the units of E divided by Hertz, you know, or divided by radians per second. So these are the units of some e, e naught, say, uh, divided by radian, radians per second. All right. So, so if you see a spectrum, you know, you can even think of this as an audio spectrum. 
you see a spectrum with some, some base and, and some trouble here um, if this is in Hertz. The, the height of these is some uh, amplitude per Hertz, right? And if you added up all the amplitudes per Hertz, you would get some total amount of, of power. We just have to keep track of the units just because because of this integral here has units. Um, I'm taking a spectral density, not just coefficients of, of discrete uh, discrete components here. So you know if I were to take a spectrum, the finer I the, the better I'm able to take a spectrum, the, the less power is in each of the finer spectral bins. That just represents the fact that the thing I'm actually taking is a spectral density, like a probability density versus a probability. You have to be a little bit careful about the units. Okay, so so with that said, let's uh, eventually I want to send this this arbitrary thing through an interferometer and and watch what comes out. But let me sort of just show you uh, in a numerical simulation in Python what what happens, and let me talk about. Uh, how, how to think of white light and filtered light in terms of spectral stuff and, and time. So let me share my let me share my screen here. All right, so this should be a Python notebook. Um, don't don't worry too much about the. I'll I'll mostly just show you plots and describe the plots. So don't don't worry too much about how I get them. So what I'm doing in this first line is I'm generating two to the 16, because that's a nice, uh, a nice number for, for doing Fourier math. Two to the 16 samples, where each sample is spaced by 10 to the minus three seconds. So this is, this is not optical. This is more like uh, audio or some other signal. Um, and and my, my E field, my kind of fake, very low frequency E field here, maybe this is like radio. Um, is just going to be drawn from normal a normal distribution. So at every little time step, I'm going to just going to draw a random number from a normal distribution, and that will be my signal. And let me plot that. And let me hope it comes up. Okay, something. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Why is this not working? Okay, there we go. All right, so. Um, this is a lot of samples. So I've got 60, 60 seconds worth of this electric field where at each little timestamp, I'm drawing from a normal distribution. And let me show that a little bit differently. Here, I'm just plotting it with a normal line. So everything's kind of all mushed together. If I plot each sample as a little tiny dot, I don't know how well this shows up over the video, but you can sort of see that there's a whole lot of little dots, but they're kind of concentrated around zero and they fall off. As as you go further away, so, uh, so this is a very uh, a, a signal that's just totally random. At every at every timestamp, get a totally random uh, amplitude. And let me zoom in on the first little bit of this signal. So the first two hundred samples, so the first point two seconds of this, um, and here I'll connect the dots. And you see it just sort of bounces around. So this is like a a random walk, basically, except it's not really a random walk. It's just an independent random number drawn at every sample. So, so what? Why am I doing this? What is this a model of? Well, this is sort of a model of white light. So let me let me show you the spectrum of this signal. A signal that where just every every time sample I just draw a totally independent uh, value for the amplitude. And to do that, we're going to use something called the fast Fourier transform. And in the homework that I'll post later, you'll do some, some problems with the fast Fourier transform involving audio processing. So you can actually sort of hear and see what's going on a little bit. Um, we'll really use this when we get to diffraction, but we'll use it in two dimensions. It's a little bit hard to, hard to understand what's going on in two dimensions if you don't have a little bit of experience doing this in one dimension. So the, the Fourier, fast Fourier transform is just a fast way of taking the Fourier transform of this signal. And so I'll do that. I'll take the fast Fourier transform and I'll print it out. And the, the, uh, this prints out as complex numbers. So J is the, 
sort of engineering and Python way of writing i, the square root of minus one. And, and so each of these are complex numbers. And this for a transform of e as a function of time, this is like e as a function of omega or e as a function of frequency. Um, so I wanna plot this. I wanna plot the spectrum of this totally random uniform signal. And so to do that, uh, I need to ask, okay, so these are just samples here. They're samples in frequency. And there's a Python function that just says, all right, when I take a Fourier transform, I get a bunch of samples. What is the frequency corresponding to those samples? That's what this one does. And there's zero Hertz up, 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 up. And then there's at the very end of this array, there's some negative, negative numbers. And if I were to plot this, this uh, frequency, uh, so this is the index of that array and the frequency that it represents. So when I take the Fourier transform of something in, and this is pretty true in, in almost all programming languages, it starts off with zero frequency. That's the first element of the array. The frequency goes up, 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 to some maximum. And then, and then it starts listing the negative frequencies, starting at the very lowest negative frequency. So when you look at these arrays, you have to be a little bit careful interpreting them because the positive frequencies come first and then all the negative frequencies come. And uh, uh, wh why they do that, it probably has to do with the efficiency of the, the computation. But as long as you know that, as long as you know to call this function to ask, okay, every index of my spectrum, what frequency does it represent? Uh, I think you'll be fine. And so let me plot, and so let me plot the frequency on the x-axis and the absolute value of the spectrum on the y-axis. So this is the spectrum of that signal. And it, you'll notice two features. One, it's sort of, it is also kind of random. It's pretty flat. So here's zero Hertz. It goes up to 500 Hertz. And there's, there's a few spikes and things just from random fluctuations, but the overall trend is pretty flat. You'll also notice that it's symmetric. So anything here on the right is mirrored on the left. And this is true for all the spectra of real signals. So just from the thing I just sort of showed on the board. So I'm not plotting the phase of anything. I'm just plotting the, the magnitude. And positive frequency stuff are just mirrored over on negative frequency stuff. So whenever you see these frequency plots, you only need to really look at one side and the other side is the mirror. Uh, okay, so let's, this is a model for white light. Its spectrum is pretty flat. Um, now. The issue with the Fourier transform is it's, it's uh, you can invert it, right? So it has to contain as much information as the original signal. So there are 65,000 time samples. So there must be 65,000 frequency samples. This isn't a very good spectrum. Normally we, um, normally we bin the spectrum a little bit. And if we bin the spectrum, we get what something something called a power spectral density. So here we're just kind of, and, and this is only positive frequencies. Uh, and it's pretty flat. And we usually, when you, when you call this function, it automatically plots it on a log scale. Or maybe I should have given my, uh, my Y label as, as log, log of log base 10. Um, I'll fix that in a second. So it's pretty flat throughout the whole uh, spectrum of frequencies that can be represented by the sampled signal but with a little bit of random fluctuation. All right, so this is, this is sort of our representation of white light. But, but we want a, a representation of light that's, that's not completely white, completely flat. That's maybe been filtered through uh, say a red, a red filter. And so to do that, I'm going to take this this spectrum, and I'm going to multiply by a Gaussian that looks like this. So there's a Gaussian. It's pretty narrow, uh, and and it it'll you'll see why it's narrow in a second, just for demonstration purposes. Um, a Gaussian centered around uh, I don't know 50 hertz or something. And uh, of course, because this is a a real signal, we want everything to be symmetric around zero. So this is this is a single, a single frequency that's pretty narrow um, and, and that's, it's symmetric. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my, my Fourier transformed electric field and multiply by this filter. I'll plot that. So here there's, 
a lot of samples, very dense, but uh, but they're filtered out. They have this nice Gaussian shape now. And if I were to take the inverse for a transform of that, IFFT, um, I would get a filtered version of that signal. Now, because of rounding errors, the, the inverse for a transform is is almost real, but there are very tiny imaginary parts. So I'm just going to throw out the tiny imaginary part rounding errors to just keep the real signal. And I'll plot that. So this is this is a filtered version of signal. It doesn't look that different, but let me zoom in again, show you the zoomed in version. So as you can imagine, if I'm filtering in a narrow band around 50 hertz, say, um, you'll get a signal that whose dominant time component is this 50 hertz oscillation. And because there is some spread around 50 hertz, there's the amplitude is not perfectly constant. And if I were to really time the zero crossings here, they wouldn't exactly happen perfectly regularly. That's what it means to have some, some slightly wide spectrum. It's, it's not a perfect sine wave. It's, a, it's an approximate sine wave. And so there's some blobbiness here in, in terms of the, the amplitude. Here, the amplitude happens to be really small for a while. Um, there's some uh, spread in the, in the zero crossings. So this is an example of like, you know, say red light, you know, light that's been filtered through a red filter or say the, the spectrum of a red LED. You know, of course, uh, the time scale is way off, but uh, it's, it's sort of dominantly one, one frequency, one wavelength, but not entirely. Um, so now let's, uh, what's the next thing I'm gonna do? Oh, plot the power spectral density of this. So this is, this is just the, the Fourier transform binned in spectral bins, again, on a log scale. Let me, Say log base 10 of that. Um, and so there's a peak here, and the peak is at, if I scroll a little bit, um, if I'm in notebook mode as opposed to inline mode, I can actually just like mouse over here and see the peak is at x equals 48, 50. So the peak is at 50 hertz, and um, it falls off quite a lot. Remember, again, this is a log scale. so. Uh, you're down by quite a bit here, uh, uh, a little a little bit away from the 50 hertz. Okay, so um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the interferometer does for this this kind of signal. So so the first thing I want you to take away is that white light is basically totally random thermal fluctuations at at all at all frequencies at any given time. The amplitude of the signal is just totally random. Um, if you pass white light through a filter, like a, a red red piece of glass or the the red filter on your red pixel of your camera, um, it uh, it will band pass filter that that light. And now we're going to pass that light through an interferometer. And remember what the interferometer does is it takes a copy of that light. So it takes you know a signal that looks a lot like this. And it adds it to a copy that's shifted by a little bit. So depending on how imbalanced the arms of the interferometer are, that determines the shift of the, the copy that gets added. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to animate this effect of the interferometer. So in blue, which is not moving, that's just E of T. It's just the original random signal. In green is just a shifted version of E of T. So it, you know, you can see that it, the green waveform is not changing, it's just sliding. And then red is just the sum of the two. So let me let this run itself out for a second. And the, so, so what the interferometer measures, if, if I were to have a detector that was extremely fast, I would be able to measure that red line directly, that sum. But I don't have a, I don't have a detector that's extremely fast. I just measure the average intensity. So uh, let me stop this for a second. And I'll show it in a different form that can be slid around. Computing, computing. It's a little bit faster on my desktop. <laughs> 
Okay. So, so an interferometer would, the amplitude of the wave is this red, but the interferometer measures intensity, which is some time average of this amplitude. So when the arms of the interferometer are equally spaced, the green and the blue totally overlap, and the sum has pretty high constructive and pretty high destructive interference. So here, the, the sum is pretty big. And if I were to take the intensity, which is squaring this red wave and taking the time average, um, I get quite big peaks, which get squared to even bigger values, and, and they average out to be a pretty big value. Now, if I were to move the arms just a little bit so that the peaks line up with the troughs, I get destructive interference. Not complete destructive interference, because remember, this isn't an exact sine wave. It's, it's sort of a sine wave with some, with some bandwidth. So the destructive interference isn't complete. There's still some, some peaks. But certainly, the, the intensity of this wave is way bigger than the intensity there. And so if I had the interferometer set to equal path length, I would get a bright signal out. And if I set it to exactly half a wavelength off, I get a pretty dim signal out. And then if I turn the knob a little bit more and set it to exactly one wavelength off, I get a pretty big signal again. And as I go, the signal sort of oscillates between big and small, big and small, big and small. But what happens is when I get far enough away, the, the randomness in the signal has, has made it so that destructive interference is no longer completely destructive and constructive interference is no longer completely constructive, right? If you go far enough away in the wave, the accumulation of slight shifts in all of the zero crossings are gonna make it so that the peaks and the troughs don't line up as well as they used to. And, uh, and so the farther, the farther I turn the knob, the less, the, the less bright the peaks are and the less uh, well the less bright the, the maxima are and the less dim the minima are. And uh, you know I only simulated out to a little bit, but if I could calculate this and just plot instead of plotting the waveform as a function of of uh, interferometer offset, if I just actually plot the intensity, I, I square this thing and I time average over the whole uh, the whole long waveform, um, I will get a plot of what the interferometer sees. So that's the next calculation, and I will plot that. So here, uh, on the x-axis, there's the time shift. So in the animation above, I only ever went to positive time shifts. But you can see that when, when the interferometer is exactly aligned, the peak is very bright. All the peaks line up, all the troughs line up. And then when I'm half a wavelength off, I get very good destructive interference and then constructive interference again, but it's not quite as good. Destructive, constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive. And eventually, I get far enough away where the the randomness uh, uh, washes out the the peaks and the troughs, and the intensity just sort of averages to some some mid level value. Right? Its intensity is never is always positive because it's a uh, it's a uh, the time average of the magnitude squared of something. So the intensity is always going to be zero or, or above. But when I'm really far off with the interferometer, it just sort of averages to some uniform mush. And turning the knob doesn't really make that much of a difference. Uh, and what's interesting is that the, and you might imagine this from the animation, the narrower I make the filter, the longer I can turn this knob and still have the peaks and troughs line up. So let me do that. Let me just show you. Um, let me show you making the filter narrower. So the filter is already pretty narrow, but here's where I set the sigma of the filter. Let me go down to, uh, I don't know, 200. That's pretty narrow. Uh, okay, why is this taking time? Yeah, maybe I need to restart. 
Oh, no, okay, that works. Okay, so here's here's my narrower filter. I'll filter the waveform. Now the now the waveform has much narrower peaks. Um, I'll transform it back into time, plot that, zoom in on the plot. Now the plot looks a little bit cleaner because I filtered it to be much narrower. The the changes in amplitude happen over a much longer periods, and the zero crossings are a little bit more consistent. It's more close to an ideal sine wave. I take the spectrum, I get a much narrower spectrum. If I make this animation again, there's not much to see here. The peaks and the troughs are going to line up, and they're going to keep lining up and keep lining up and keep lining up. There's not a whole lot that's going on here. Let me stop this animation, and let me show you the the fringes. So the, the number here went down because I've got I let less light through, but the pattern extends out for much longer. So this is uh, uh, the, the peaks line up with the peaks for more. I can shift it more and more and more and more. The peaks are going to line up with the peaks. So this is what happens when you put white light through an interferometer. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have stopped sharing the screen. Let me ask if if there are any any questions about that, maybe conceptually, not. And then we'll dive into the math and actually talk about uh, you know how to how to calculate these things and uh, and see what's going on. But hopefully, conceptually, you see that the narrower I filter the light, the longer I will have the peaks and troughs line up with each other. Uh, okay, so I'm going to erase some things and uh, take some questions. All right, so the first thing I'm going to tackle, so that First thing I'm going to tackle is uh, just really working out what I mean by various spectra, and making sure I sort of get the units and all the all the constants a little bit right, because we haven't really dealt with this kind of spectral density kind of stuff before, and that goes um, that goes under the name of Parseval's theorem. So maybe some of you have learned this. So if you Percival's theorem. So this is if you start out with, so I'm going to drop electric fields for now. I'm just going to talk about some generic function, f of t. If I were to write this as a continuous sum, an integral over some coefficient f tilde omega times e to the i omega t, so I'm going to write f of t as a sum of uh, complex exponentials, the sum of sines and cosines, weighted by this Fourier coefficient. Um, what I want to calculate is that if you, well, what I want to show you is that if you calculate the total energy on either, either by squaring and summing the time signal or the total energy by squaring and summing the frequency signal, that I get the same, the same result. So here's sort of a density in time. Here's a density in frequency. And if I were to calculate the integral time integral of magnitude of f of t squared, I want to show eventually that this is equal to the same, same integral of f tilde with, with the right two pi's in the right places. So let me do that. Let me write this first as integral from minus infinity to infinity dt. So I'm going to write magnitude of f of t squared as f of t times f star of t. 
And now I'm going to plug in, plug in my definition for f of t and f star of t. This is going to be some big thing in parentheses that looks a lot like that times some other big thing in parentheses that looks like the complex conjugate of that. So the first one I'll go from minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two pi, tilde of omega pi omega t. That's just f of t. Complex conjugate. Well, here here I need a different uh, different variable to integrate over because eventually I want to. If you think of this as just a a, um, a sum of a whole bunch of terms, and this is a sum of a whole bunch of terms. Eventually, I want to multiply them all together, and get, you know, keep track of all the cross terms properly. In order to do that, I need to declare a new variable of integration here, omega prime. So that's still real. That's fine. So f oops, f tilde, f tilde of omega prime now, uh, star, and e to the i omega t becomes e to the, oops. to the minus i omega prime of t. All right, so let's multiply this out. So of course, this only makes sense if everything converges properly. So I'm not gonna, not gonna worry about the detailed convergence properties. But I have three integrals. I have an integral over time, an integral over omega, an integral over omega prime. And let me let me sort of factor them out in a particular way here. So let me uh, you know imagine writing this as a sum and then regrouping terms. I'll move this integral of d omega prime. Uh, I, I shall keep the d omega first for two pi. I'm going to write the integral as infinity to infinity d omega prime over two pi. Um, and now I'll write f tilde of omega, f tilde of omega prime star as these two terms. And now I'm going to write this last integral. So none of this depends on time. All right, these are just spectral coefficients. They don't depend on time. So I can move the time integral all the way in. Minus infinity to infinity dt of e to the i omega minus omega prime t. All right, so who remembers what this, what this integral is from quantum or maybe even stat mac? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, this comes up a lot. Um, in the limit where these limits really do go to infinity, uh, what does this integral tend to? Oh man, maybe you haven't used this much in quantum. This becomes a delta function. So if you were if you were to do this for finite limits, um, it would become like a a sine of sine of omega over omega uh, with some with some finite limits. And if you take that uh, you take that sine of omega over omega, it's sorry the sine of omega capital T, maybe the limit over omega. And if you take the limit as T goes to infinity, that, that sine of X over X shape gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And it looks more and more like a delta function. So that's, uh, I, I, if you have not done this a lot in your physics careers, you will soon. Um, so this is, uh, is a delta function here. And two pi is just for you know, bookkeeping purposes. This is nice because we can use this delta function to do the d omega prime integral, and this two pi neatly cancels that two pi. So let me do that minus infinity to infinity. We still have this d omega integral. Um, so I'm going to do this this integral with the delta function, and the two pi has gone away. And so now I have f tilde of omega, f tilde of now omega has or omega prime has become omega because the delta function star. And I'm done. And I can write this as 
and I go from minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two pi times the magnitude of the frequency spectrum of f squared. And so that's sort of what we wanted to prove. It's what Parseval's theorem was all about. If I calculate the power, the magnitude squared of something in time, or uh, really it's, sorry, this isn't the power, this is the total energy, or total energy. So the power would be a rate, but I'm integrating the power over all time, sort of, I'm putting it in quotes because we'll see what it really is in terms of electric fields in a second. I can calculate the total energy um, by integrating magnitude squared in time, or if I know the Fourier coefficients, I know the frequency spectrum, I can integrate the frequency spectrum um, over, uh, over all frequencies. So this is just saying if I have some signal in time and I take its magnitude squared in time and I integrate everywhere versus having a frequency spectrum of the signal, and the frequency spectrum looks like that, and I take the magnitude squared of the frequency spectrum and I integrate everywhere. Um, those should give me the same result. I should be able to calculate total power either way. Um, this is gonna be useful for kind of bookkeeping purposes. And when we talk about what, what do we mean by intensity of these continuous frequency, continuous frequency things. Um, let me, let me rewrite, I'll just write the result up here and then we'll, we'll apply this to electric fields and intensities. Same, same math, so V omega two pi magnitude F of omega tilde of omega squared. All right, and, and the two pi's just come from the fact that uh, omega equals two pi F. And so D omega is just two pi df. So if I started out with, a, with an honest integral over honest frequencies f, and I changed to, to uh, angular coordinates, uh, my df would become d omega over 2 pi. That's where, that's where the 2 pi's come from. So you could just switch back and forth between real honest frequencies and angular frequencies. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful if you want to do the bookkeeping properly with the 2 pi's. Uh, so I will translate this kind of Parseval, Parseval's theorem into electric field and intensity. And I think we'll, we'll end there today. And uh, we will have class on Friday. It'll be sort of a short class where I actually take the electric field and stick it into an interferometer and calculate what happens when I do that with some with some spectrum. And what we'll see is that the pattern that's formed on the interferometer is the Fourier transform of the uh, frequency spectrum that I put in. So you can use an interferometer by scanning interferometer, you can measure the Fourier transform of the spectrum of the light that goes in. All right, so, so this, this energy here, integrated over time or integrated over frequency, um, that's, that's not exactly what we measure for, uh, for, uh, for uh, light, right? We, we don't measure the total energy. We have a power meter that measures power. We could take a whole bunch of measurements of power and integrate them over time. That's not usually what we do. We measure the average power. So, so the time average, time average, average power, we don't integrate from negative infinity to infinity. We integrate over some finite time and, and do a little average. So I'm gonna write this time average power. I'm gonna write this as um, the integral from minus t over two to t over two. This is some interval of length t centered around zero of f of t magnitude squared. So this is some finite amount of integration, but I'm gonna divide by t to get, get the power. So the units of this dt and t cancel, and I just have the units of, of this original uh, magnitude of f squared. This is, this is just a time average over, over, a, maybe over, over interval, interval t. And 
what I want is in order to really take, take the time average, I want to take the limit as this interval gets, gets pretty large. And it doesn't have to be literally infinite, but it's just long compared to fluctuations that I care about. So for light, since they're fluctuating at terahertz, any power meter I can buy will automatically do this. It's basically you're, you're integrating for a very long time. Um, so let me, let me translate that on this side. This is, all I did was I, um, I divided by T and I took the limit. So this is gonna be the limit as T goes to infinity of one over T times this stuff. And let me move the one over T in, right? So infinity, infinity G omega over two pi times magnitude of the frequency spectrum squared over T. And this, uh, this is what I'm going to call, uh, actually, let me, let me even move the limit in, sorry. I wanna highlight a particular thing. So I'm doing nothing other than dividing by T and taking the limit as T goes to infinity. So uh, I will write this as an integral from infinity to infinity d omega over two pi times the limit as t goes to infinity of this. And it's this thing that I will define as like the power spectrum, p. So this is what we measure with a spectrometer and this is what we want to measure. It's, uh, it's the, uh, the, the power of the signal uh, averaged over some amount of time. So let me translate this in the last minute. Let me just translate this into an actual intensity. Let me remind you that instead of writing some generic function f like this, we really want the electric field as a function of time to be an integral from minus infinity to infinity d omega over two pi electric field spectrum as a function of omega e to the i omega t. Um, and the intensity is the time average, uh, one over eta, just to get it in the right units, the time average of the magnitude of this electric field squared, averaged over some, some interval of time. Um, and, and what do we mean by that? Well, it's so one over eta comes along for the ride. It's gonna be a time average, so the limit limit as t goes to infinity of adding up everything from t over two to t, from minus t over two to plus t over two. E, e of t magnitude squared. And just from, from this uh, sort of, this was for a generic f, I could just turn all the f's into e's here. Uh, there's still this one over eta here. Um, uh, let me actually keep and put the one over eta inside of everything. So this is integral from minus infinity to infinity, omega over two pi, one over eta limit as t goes to infinity. I'm running out of room here. I'll just write it on the next line. Uh, let's see. Equals integral from minus infinity to infinity, d omega over two pi, one over eta, limit as t goes to infinity of magnitude of e tilde omega squared over this t that we're gonna send to infinity. So all this stuff here This has units of intensity, and this is the intensity spectrum. I tilde of omega. So this is what you would measure if you were to measure with a, you know, with a regular spectrometer. You, you send light into a diffraction grating and you measure the intensity that comes out in different positions. And depending on how uh, small your your aperture is letting it into your power meter, you get more and more accurate measurements and you have to average over longer and longer times. 
But that's that's what this means. This is how you have to deal with this one over t just to keep track of the fact that we're dealing with a spectral density instead of a, you know discrete sum of cosines. All right, so that was that was pretty mathy, and I would say next lecture we're going to do a lot of similar tricks, but actually putting the electric field into the interferometer and watching what comes out. And what we'll see is that what comes out as you turn the interferometer and you make the path length uh, unequal, what comes out is going to be a, a pattern of intensity that's the Fourier transform of this, this spectrum. So you can take, take a spectrum by turning a knob of an interferometer and recording the intensity as a function of, of displacement. All right, so sorry I went a little bit over. I've got to run. Some of you have to run. Um, I will see you on Friday for the conclusion of this, where we actually show that the interferometer gives you the Fourier transform of the, the intensity spectrum.